mentioned, my name is Denise Cardozo, and I am the Executive Director of Silicon Valley Forum. So before we get started, I would like to thank our wonderful partners at Avanta Ventures. This event would not be possible without their support, and we are extremely grateful for our wonderful partnership with them. So thank you so much, David. I would also like to tell you a little bit about our organization, Silicon Valley Forum. We are a 37-year-old nonprofit organization supporting the global startup and technology ecosystem. We organize over 50 or so events per year, including innovation programs and boot camps for startups and executives, technology programs and conferences, including our upcoming Women and Tech Festival, which, you will, which we hope that you will support by going to our website and purchasing a ticket. We also do program series for entrepreneurs, women in STEM, and always with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you want to find out more about our many other programs and events we do, as well as sponsorship information, please visit our website at siliconvalleyforum.com. We are also a proud division of the Silicon Valley Organization, or the SVO for short. They share the same commitment for business, startup, and technology community, bringing together leaders and influencers. They are a catalyst for business growth and a champion for a stronger community. They offer many resources and programs to educate and support your company and startup. So I encourage you to find out more about them membership opportunities and the incredible work, incredible work that they do at the svo.com. And if you have any questions about how to be involved in either organization, I will put that contact information into the chat box. And we hope that you really do wanna be involved with us. So we have some incredible speakers um, joining us today from Delta Airlines, Beep, Zipcar, and Passport as we discuss what the future of transportation will look like in a post-COVID-19 era. Leading the discussion is our moderator, David Lee, who is a principal at Avanta Ventures. So David, I'm going to turn this over to you now, and thank you so much. Awesome, thanks, Denise. Um, first of all, super excited to be co-hosting this event with uh, Silicon Valley Forum, and thanks everyone um, for joining us today. Uh, as a Quick intro for those of you who don't know us. Uh, Avanta Ventures is the venture arm of CSAA, which is one of the insurance groups within the AAA ecosystem. Uh, we're largely focused on early stage Series A venture investments across a couple of key verticals around mobility, insure tech, and some adjacent spaces. Uh, we also run a venture studio program here at Avanta where we'll work with earlier stage seed and pre-seed stage companies. Uh, I sit on the investment team here at Avanta Ventures, um, spend a lot of my time uh, nerding out about all things mobility, um, which as many of you uh, on this call know, is an industry that's experienced um, a substantial amount of change, right? Pre-COVID and now with COVID. That pace of change is only continuing to accelerate. Um, so I'm super thrilled to be joined here by our amazing panel. Uh, and, and rather than not doing their backgrounds enough justice by me giving the introduction. I'm going to invite our four esteemed panelists here to introduce themselves. So um, maybe we'll just kind of go down the line here, but uh, could you share a little bit with our audience, um, a little bit more about your background, about your companies and kind of what you're focused on as well. Scott, since you're unmuted, I'm going to go with, start off with you. Absolutely, David. Good afternoon uh, to all those in the West Coast. And I saw Peru is on board as well. And so thanks for thanks for joining. Uh, really uh, pleased to be here. And uh, my name is Scott Santoro. As David said, I'm the Vice President for Los Angeles and West Coast Sales for Delta America. Airlines. Hopefully um, you've experienced Delta in your time uh, before, but uh, just you know, pleased to be here and look forward to answering your questions. I guess I'll go next. Uh, my name is Raquel Aysa. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at BEEP. We're an Orlando-based autonomous mobility as a service provider. And so uh, we essentially uh, focus on planning, deployment, and safe operation of autonomous vehicles within fixed route and geofence areas. Uh, we're headquartered in Orlando, Florida. Uh, in fact, we're leading one of the largest uh, AV deployments 
parks and public roads in North America here in Lake Nona in conjunction with uh, our primary uh, partner, Tavistock. Um, we've also done a number of deployments as well throughout the state of Florida and happy to answer any questions about that. We'll go next. Hi, everybody. My name is Bob Joachim. I'm the CEO of Passport. Uh, Passport supports um, over a thousand cities in North America and in the UK, primarily around transportation software that delivers an operating system that uh, manages interactions with the curb. So think about anything in um, parking, loading zone, electric vehicle, and, and in the future, autonomous vehicle. Um, and on the flip side, compliance to those rules and regulations on the curb. So if you ever got a parking ticket on your windshield, apologies for that, that's probably our system. Um, but it all goes to creating more livable and equitable communities um, that we all uh, move around in. So looking forward to providing that perspective here uh, today uh, on the panel. Thank you. And maybe I'll just jump in. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Sussman, uh, and I oversee all public partnerships, public policy, and communications at Zipcar. Uh, you may have heard of Zipcar. We are a not-so-young um, startup now of 20 years. Um, that's how long Zipcar has been in the car sharing business. So since 1999, um, we are sort of the world's largest and leading car sharing entity, and we specialize in fleet-owned vehicles that travel round trip. So you pick up a car probably at the curb using Passport technology uh, that the city's been investing in. You take it away for an hour, up to two weeks. You bring it back. Um, gas, maintenance, insurance, and all those hassles about car ownership are on us. Um, and maybe I'll just say one thing on background. I've been at Zipcar for about three years now, but come from the public policy space. So come from spending time in the federal government and then in a city hall, really on the government side of mobility um, and how our cities help move people. Great. Uh, thank you all. And uh, for folks in the audience, um, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box as they come up. Uh, I'll be monitoring that throughout our conversation and we'll uh, interweave your questions in here into our discussion today. Um, and with that, so let's dive right in. Uh, I know this panel was titled The Future of Transportation in a Post-COVID Era, but I actually think it's really important before we start talking about the future to understand where we are now in terms of transportation and mobility in our current environment, where people are working from home and, and sheltering in place for the most part. So I'd like to start a conversation here today. Um, and as we're all well aware, COVID has had significant impacts on driving, on, on flying, on how people move generally. Um, so for our panelists, first question, you know, as each of you kind of look at your respective businesses pre-COVID to the initial lockdown to now, how have things changed uh, for your companies and what are some strategies that you and your company have, have taken to adapt to this disruption, at least in the near term? I guess I'll uh, jump in there in terms of, um, you know, we specialize in deploying and managing services involving autonomous vehicles. So, you know, we have those strategic partnerships with AV suppliers. And so obviously during COVID, like many um, companies out there, we had to pause our service uh, as the number of cases started to go up within the state and frankly around the country. We had to pause because we didn't want to be part of the problem. Uh, we wanted to be part of the solution. And so during this time, we actually looked at, you know, we're dedicated to providing that first mile, last mile solution for passengers. Well, if we have no passengers, well then what do we do with them? Uh, and what do we do with our technology? And so we were actually, you know, if there's one word that I would say describes our company during this time, it's been flexible. So we've actually repurposed our technology during COVID from starting March 30th up until recently. Uh, we were autonomously transporting COVID-19 test samples from the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And so the way that worked was we had our shuttles, which we, used to transport passengers. And so we did a partnership with the Jacksonville Transportation Authority and Mayo Clinic here in Florida, and we created a route on a private campus. And so uh, the way it worked was people would get swabbed from these uh, drive-through testing sites. And then once they had an, a good amount of test swabs, they loaded it into the shuttle, closed the doors, the shuttle drove itself in autonomous mode with no attendant on board in the closed campus and then uh, brought those samples to another part of the campus for processing. And so what that allowed us to do was be flexible and repurpose our technology uh, and also limit the exposure to the virus and then allow healthcare workers to be where they should be, which is on the front line. So if there's one thing I would say that we've done as a company is, is been flexible during this time. 
Yeah, I would I would add to that, uh, David. You know, I think it's all good for us to step back and get perspective that this is such a unique situation, unlike other sort of uh, um, dislocations that the the market or the world has seen. And for all intents and purposes, the world stopped moving um, in March, and we saw a huge drop. I mean, not just in driving, but in flying and just all modes of transportation, and that included beep. Um, but what we're seeing now as cities start to reopen from the self-induced coma that we, we started in, which started as a healthcare crisis and move into economic crisis, and cities and municipalities are feeling this budgetary gap um, due to the fact that they also had to shut down, which is unprecedented for cities. You never see cities shut down, and it would be akin to almost being at war, like where you would see a complete shutdown and shelter in place. And so I think none of us have, have, have experienced that and there's no book for that. But what we are seeing um, is as we recover, because Passport is on sort of the central nervous system of this on the front lines in, in terms of leading indicators, is that what we find is the data suggests a few things across the markets that we see. One is that parking volume has returned and driving has returned um, far greater than pre-COVID. So people are driving a lot more than they, than they were before. Um, however, where they're driving and how they're driving is very different. So no one's rushing into downtown urban core districts or entertainment because events um, and, and those sorts of things have, have also paused. Um, the other thing we see is that the, the way in which we manage or the cities are having to manage the inventory and the regulatory rules with the advent of now um, on demand food delivery and the, the increase in demand for the curb for these type of digital services is also putting them, uh, them meaning the cities, in a position where they didn't have the right infrastructure in place and it's been lacking for, for decades and now they're having to come up to speed and accommodate to the needs of a community which is further exacerbating this crisis. Um, but in, in return, because e-commerce and on demand isn't going to go away, I think there's some permanent changes in how consumers are going to um, uh, transact in the future that isn't going to change. It's only going to increase congestion in cities as we see a permanent shift in demand curves for individual modes of transportation. Um, no one's really rushing to get on mass transit or um, uh, those types of modes unless you're an essential workforce, which means that it's only going to further um, require additional policy and regulation to help and manage some of these aspects. But um, overall, the, the market is recovering from a, from a movement perspective as things loosened up. It's, it's just we've changed in the behaviors of how we're, uh, we're moving throughout those communities. And I think that's going to, that's going to stay um, at least in our model. You know, we, uh, I'm curious what other folks have done, but we have shut down our workforce coming into the office through July of 2021 um, because there's no need for us to go in. I think we've all, unless you have to have remote to this uh, or have adapted to a remote dynamic and trying to do our part in, in cur you know, curving the, the spike. But I think as we think about what's here to stay and what um, is going to change fundamentally as how we operate as a community, I think is going to be interesting. I'd love to hear from others. But I think that's, that's a challenge for cities and an opportunity for all of us coming out of this crisis. To how, how can we use this shift to um, best solve some of those existing gaps and some of the new ones that have been exposed uh, as a result of this? Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just dovetail to some of Bob's comments. You know, I think Zipcar is in a perhaps a unique case. Um, I, I actually think Delta shares this. You know, we provide what is an essential service for those essential trips. And so throughout the pandemic, we showed up every single day. Our employees in the field showed up every single day. Our members showed up every day because we were giving people access to the grocery store, to their jobs, to visit their family and friends, to medical tests, to medical care. So we certainly saw um, a decrease in demand shortly after the pandemic began. Like what Bob was suggesting, what we've seen, particularly in the last maybe two and a half months, is a roaring back of demand. Um, really, you know, I can illustrate that in New York City, um, which is our largest global market, we've seen demand exceed 70% of what it was in July of last year. Um, and, and we think it's because people are making really conscious choices about what trips they have to make 
and what the right mode is, which at the end of the day really is sort of the principal idea behind Zipcar's mission to enable simple and responsible urban living. Our goal when we started 20 years ago is the same goal today, which is you don't actually need to own a car to still have access to all the things that a car can bring you to. And so what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that just because of the number of trips someone's taking during a week maybe has been cut down significantly, doesn't mean that there still aren't trips that have to happen with a vehicle. Uh, and, and so we've really been operating through all of this. I think as we look at what comes next, we're continuing to see people in cities make some tough decisions about how they feel about public transit, how they feel about walking and biking, whether or not they're buying vehicles. And what we hear from our members is that they don't want to be saddled with some of those burdens associated with car ownership, but they recognize that, you know, it's really hard to take three cases of seltzer on your bike, uh, where it's really hard to, you know, get a new desk for your at-home office at Ikea and then walk it home. Um, and so that we're really a part of that fabric moving forward. I will say, as you sort of look at the landscape um, throughout the past several months and in 2020 in totality, um, we've seen many major car share operators actually fold, close, limit services. We made a decision very early on in the pandemic that continuing to operate was our number one. We wanted to do that safely for the sake of our members and for the sake of our employees, but that we never shut down service because we felt that ownership shouldn't be your ticket to access, particularly in a global health crisis. Well said, Sabrina and, and fellow panelists. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I would start by saying, I think from Delta's perspe perspective, resiliency and innovative uh, is something that we've, we've done for um, upwards of 90 years. And I think over the past, call it six months, I mean, we've never seen anything like this in, in uh, the history of the airline. You know, back on you know end of January, you can kind of timeline yourself uh, when the pandemic broke uh, to when it hit um, Italy, to when it hit Europe, to kind of following and progressing throughout where we are today. Uh, it's been pretty dr dramatic on our system. It's been a pretty, it's been a, it's been a drain, of course, of resources. But you know, Delta is one that just stands by the innovation of the product and what we needed to do to ensure that Delta survived. And so I would say from our perspective is we had to evaluate three things, is we had to evaluate the safety of our employees. Uh, to Sabrina's point, we never shut down. We never went away. Uh, you know, we went from flying over 4,000 flights a day to just a few hundred a day back in March and April. Um, I, I think there's a term Bob used earlier, but, you know, we, we um, effectively put the airline to sleep. Uh, for the month of April. And, you know, we saw revenue dive 90, 95% just in, just in a day alone. Um, and then March 13th, day that lives in infamy in, in my history, in my lifetime, uh, is when, you know, sort of national state of emergency. And, and from that point forward, it's, it's just been, uh, it's been something that we don't have a playbook for. There is no revenue model. There's no revenue forecast. There's no system. There's no smart algorithm that tells you what tomorrow is going to do when the pandemic breaks out in the next city or state or county that it's broken out into. But I think what, what we've been able to do is continue flying. I mean, we, we brought the system down uh, exponentially overnight and we've been really rebuilding it. And I don't wanna use the word um, a sort of resilient or rebounding uh, in terms of what our network has been able to do, but we've been following the forecast. You know, for a while we were, we were flying medical experts around, we were flying cargo supplies that were needed in the medical world. And I think that's been something that, you know, we, uh, we really, took to heart that we were really actually moving the country as we were moving product and moving people and doctors and nurses and, and frontline responders around the world. Uh, and now as we, as we are in sort of August heading into September, you know, we're probably 50%, 60% of the schedule we were a year ago. Uh, we're just over 25, 2,600 flights, give or take the, the day. Uh, down from, as I mentioned, over 4,000 flights a day in normal world. But, you know, we've done, um, as we kind of looked at the safety of our employees, we also had to preserve cash. And, you know, we were burning upwards of $100 million a day in the month of March, which is just pretty significant as an airline that uh, has a lot of capital resources and operational needs. Uh, and as we, as we sort of um, 
got that cash burn down to just under 30 million a day now uh, and looking to go to zero and then ultimately break even, of course. And then as you start to build up your profitability, again, uh, looking forward to 2021, you know, what's our rebound? What's our safety mechanism to how we're going to get back into this? And we've done a number of things. Many of you have heard about uh, working with our great partners through the Port Authority, through TSA. We've been able to really focus on a curb to claim uh, focus where, you know, cleanliness is the new thing and Delta care standard, as we call it, is ensuring that we have sanitization throughout the entire process. We're also blocking every middle seat uh, on the aircraft, limiting load factor caps, uh, as well as really just focused on sort of electrostatic spraying of the cabin uh, and ensuring the health and well-being of every customer and employee that, that happens to come in, in contact with travel. And uh, all of those in, in uh, three minutes or less are pretty much what we've been doing for the past six months or less. Yeah, Thank you. I, I think Scott, Scott brings up a good point, which is if others are on the phone, part of businesses, retaining optionality has been utmost important. I think for all of us on this panel, being impacted by things that are out of your control, this is not a business model issue for Delta Zipcar B Passport. It's the fact that we went into a self-induced coma and we have no idea how policy and regulation are going to affect that. I, I can tell you firsthand that we see rebounds, for example, in the UK recovering much better um, than in the US. And then when you look at the US, I can tell you that you know Illinois is rebounding better than Texas or other states because of local and state regulation of how they're handling this pandemic. And that is frustrating to see you know, for those that are in the US that I would say we've had a a, a, a lackluster response relative to what it could have been. And it has a huge impact on these businesses like Delta, like Passport and others that have to take significant actions. And if, if you don't respond in a nature that is timely, you lose optionality and, and the ability to weather uncertainty that is completely outside of the realm of control for these types of businesses that have the exposure um, like, like transportation sector does. And they're, we're vital to the infrastructure and we're vital to communities moving around. And it's, it's such an interesting dynamic. And all I can say is it seems unanimous across this phone that actions had to be taken quickly. And if you stagnate, you die in this environment because every day counts. And, you know, we don't know how, how long it's going to take or when the recovery is. And all we know is that it's going to be um, a longer recovery that will last until a vaccine comes out, which we've modeled out at the end of Q2 2021. Q3 is distribution. And so we haven't, we, we don't think that we're going to be back into Q4 2020 or Q4 2019 and Q1 2020 levels until the end of 2021. It's kind of when we think at this state, we might get back to where we were. So as a result, you have to take significant actions as a business. Uh, now. You know, I think, Bob, you, you raise a really good point. And I think for me, I've always thought about mobility through the lens of humans, right? Even if we're moving freight, even if you're moving cargo, it's about the human experience for access. It's about the human experience for purchasing, things like that. And the reality is, is that what our companies has, have gone through since March, since January, uh, really is analogous to what families have gone through, right? I mean, you reached a critical decision-making point for a lot of families that said, everything we knew to date is different and everything has changed. And so I actually take some comfort in the idea that the mobility industry is going through an analogous process to that of the people that were built to serve. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges I've long sort of wanted to combat and to face is this idea of decision making that isn't tailored to the trip, right? And so there's this concept called TDM or transportation demand management, but rethinking your commute, how do you act and how do you move yourself with more intentionality? And I think if nothing, the pandemic has certainly brought that to people's awareness. So if I have to take a trip, what are the things I want to think about? Is it, how safe is it? Is it, how convenient? Is it physically able for me? Can I walk? Can I do things like that? And that experience is one that we have really had to continue to be flexible on, similar uh, to BEEP, and, and help people think through that journey. Because I think, like so many things, you don't take the old way of doing things for granted anymore. I would totally, you know, some of the things that Scott and Bob and Sabrina are just echoing, I feel like you have been a fly on the wall in, in all of our leadership 
you know, meetings because it's, you know, you're right. And I know it's, it's been said over and over again, but there really is no playbook. And to be quite honest, what we did last week might not apply to what we have to do this week. And I think if there is one uniform theme and thread throughout it all is very much that, Sabrina. It's the human element. How is every decision that we make take into account the human element? Raquel, I think we lost your internet connection, unless that's just me. And this would be a really good station break and a commercial for air travel. And so the next time we do this, David, if we could all fly in, we can rent beep, we can use passport, of course, and, and uh, we'd all be happier and we wouldn't have to worry about mutes and thunderstorms with electrical <laughs> outages. Exactly. Sorry, you left Zipcar out of that list. I'm I sorry, I didn't get to Zipcar. I was going to do it the next one. Sorry, Zipcar. Gosh. <laughs> um, no, it's super fascinating, you guys. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the common themes I heard was actually around flexibility, right? How to you adapt your business. Um, the fact that you may need to change your business on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, so how do you think through some of that? Um, and you guys brought up a whole slew of topics there that I would love to unpack. Um, but first, a question from our audience that, uh, that just came in. Um, in terms of from the financial side, has the pandemic changed the way that you're thinking about um, your finances in terms of potentially keeping a larger cash cushion? Uh, after all of this in? I'll take that one. It's a great question. Um, you know, cash is an interesting thing. We're a publicly held company. And so as many of you know that have financial backgrounds or own your own businesses and, and or sit at the, the C-suite financial side of your companies, you know, you keep a lot of cash on hand, you become victim to a, to a takeover. And of course, that's just one of the many things. Uh, and not to mention, on top of that, you have large investments and operational and facility needs that drive cash. Uh, Delta was one where we had very low debt levels and something that we we're very proud of from 2019 and back. Uh, you know, it, it's very easy if you look through the lens of, of, of an airline and competition and my competitors, uh, there are differing degrees and theories of what should be the right debt level. And, and what Delta was able to do is take our assets that were, were fairly um, open or, or owned by Delta, and we were able to sort of use those for collateral for loans and, and to, to drum up cash in that respect, uh, which allowed us to do the investments before and pre-COVID that really enabled um, us to redo airports, to buy airplanes, and, and to pay our employees industry-leading wages. It's just really been an interesting um, sort of dichotomy of events, of events, if you will, that I think we'll go back and look at sort of where we were from a cash level perspective. But we were we were very satisfied with where we stood. Um, come you know as the as the pandemic came into play in March, and even so much. Uh, as we came out of it or uh, into the summer, rather, from a cash burn perspective and decrease, decreasing that cash burn. Uh, but, you know, having large piles of cash in the, um, in the thought of that a pandemic such as this would happen, there's just no model that you could really uh, dictate what that cash level should be. But we've done a really good job with the investment. Yeah, David, I think the answer is yes, yes, and yes. I think if you looked at what companies did, every CEO I talked to, in uh, end of February, early March, everyone drew their credit facilities full. I mean, they did not hesitate to draw down those facilities immediately, uh, us included. Um, and I think you saw that happen across all spectrums of companies, regardless of where you were in, in impact. The second thing is, um, you know, this is not the right time to be going out and getting capital. So if you're a company that is in an earlier stage and not you know, public and have access to public markets. I think that brings even an increased risk. And I think you saw some companies that did have to go out to market during this time, Airbnb publicly went out, got a huge valuation hit. Lime was another one that got, went out. There's a number of companies that had to go out um, and it's just not a good uh, dynamic. Uh, it's more out of survival, um, but it all goes down to what is the comfort level with the amount of liquidity you need to withstand something prolonged like this. So every case will be different um, and the recovery will be different depending on where you sit. But I think unanimously that the immediate um, question was what you just raised and what 
uh, Scott had mentioned, which is what is your runway? What are your, what's your runway and what's your comfort level um, of having that runway relative to when markets will open up? And yeah. I think that is probably the number one question in every, every company's uh, mind. And as a result, you know, had to take actions accordingly um, to, to preserve that optionality and that cash. Yeah. Raquel, welcome back. Um, we'll ask you for a second. Um, and, and Bob, totally hear your points. And, you know, it's one of, one of the things that when all of this hit, we actually sat down with our portfolio companies to go through all of this too, in terms of how much runway do you guys have, you know, uh, where do you need to get to, right? What are the milestones, all of those different components. Um, we're getting a number of questions on the public transit side. So I actually want to shift there. Uh, um, as most uh, everyone knows, public transit is one of the hardest hit sectors, right? People just aren't taking buses or trains or, or a lot of these other modes. Um, so question for you guys here, how are you seeing cities or, or airports uh, adapt to these sharp declines in, in ridership across buses, trains, subways? So maybe I'll just jump in here. I think, you know, there's a couple of different issues that I'd love to segment out with this question. Uh, I think that we cannot underestimate the impact of the changed workplace and commute on public transit, right? And, you know, so listening to folks talk about whether they've closed their offices, you know, indefinitely or whether they've closed their offices through June of 2021, those, those are 10 trips a week for the average American worker who works Monday through Friday that they're not making. Whether they used to make it on a bus or on Metro or in their own personal car, that's 10 trips a week that now really don't have to happen. Um, so I think when we talk a little bit about volume, there's some grand questions about when does that start to return? If more and more companies say that we don't need you in the office until June of next year, what does that mean for projections on ridership and things like that? I think the other piece here um, is really about how the media has portrayed some safety uh, issues in public transit. I think we've seen now, and understandably so, over time, our research has gotten a little bit better, our understanding of the health crisis has gotten better, and our tools for diagnosing what is and is not the right way to respond have gotten better. And so, you know, there's been recent articles that sort of talked about the way air moves through and air, um, a plane cabin, the way air moves through a transit car cabin, mm -hmm. air moves through a car. All of this is sort of part of the scientific threshold that helps us understand how we're making choices. And I think there's some really good news for transit, which is a space that was once considered really perhaps most right, it, you know, that has been proven not to be the case, and that there is safety mechanisms in there that afford the movement of air that helps protect all of us. For me, I think it's really important we continue to talk about that, educate that, talk to our consumers, talk to our members, our employees, share that science, and help talk about what other ways there are to keep people safe. Because what we don't want is we don't want people making mobility decisions driven by fear. I think we want people making mobility decisions based off of what is safe and right and appropriate and all of those things. But fear really shouldn't be the thing that guides you into a modal choice. I would, uh, Sabrina, uh, sorry I dropped off, but you know, the, the beauty of, <laughs> of work from home and bandwidth, right? So, um, you know, this kind of goes back to when I, I dropped off, you know, we have had, uh, you know, as a mobility service and as, you know, with autonomous shuttles, we have made some of the very adjustments that people have ex come to expect now when getting on um, a mode of transportation, right? So, you know, when you look at each one of our shuttles, we made the conscious decision to um, take that responsibility away from our staff on board. And we know firsthand that we're not in the business of doing a sanitation of a hospital, what's needed to combat COVID-19. So we made that decision early on. And so we've actually done a strategic partnership with a third party company that sanitizes hospitals to ensure that that same process is then instituted onto our shuttles. Uh, and then each one of our shuttles too has a hand sanitizer dispenser. It's easily accessible before anybody touches anything. Much like Delta, we have a no mask, no service policy. Um, and then we also have disinfectant wipes on each one of our shuttles as well. So it's about making pe the, the things that people have come to expect 
readily available so that they do feel comfortable coming on board and that they realize that we're not cutting corners uh, in, in anything. Well, like well said, Raquel. And if, if Bob, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in and, and uh, continue to go. I mean, I think you just have to look at the circumstances that are before you. Um, if you told me uh, March 12th that within 30 days, Delta would have stood up an entire new division called Delta Clean Standard, uh, put an entire fleet of personnel within that team, and we'd be mandating face masks at 100% requirement. I mean, you walk in the door of an airport, uh, and again, through our partnership, not only with the San Jose Port Authority, but every Port Authority uh, in the United States, and we are mandating masks. We are handing you Purell wipes as you're walking through the terminal. We're actually, we have uh, dozens and dozens of hand sanitizer stations before you even uh, get through the TSA. And then and all the work that's being done on board with electrostatic spraying. In the month of March, you know, we went out and sourced, unbeknownst that this would turn into multiple facets of pandemic uh, raging throughout the US and the world, but we went out and bought thousands of electrostatic sprayers that spray uh, effectively Lysol on steroids throughout our aircraft, every aircraft, every turn, every day. Um, and then we went out and bought face masks. I mean, millions of face masks. So if you show up at an airport and do not have a face mask, we will provide you with one. But ultimately, where all this led, we weren't the experts in medical. Delta was not the doctor of, of clean, cleanliness. We, we, we ensured our aircraft were sanitized and, clean, and cleaned every day. But we had to make this really safe for our employees and extremely safe for our customers. And so we partnered with RB and we partnered with the Mayo Clinic who are telling us what to do and how to combat it. RB, the maker of Lysol for uh, centuries, if you will, uh, decades. And they're actually monitoring our process, making recommenda recommendations. We don't do a thing without the Mayo Clinic telling us that this is right to do. Uh, and that recommendations are the middle seat and block, uh, social distancing throughout terminals, social distancing as you're deplaning. We had a flight attendant that told us we really should be thinking about boarding back to front. And that was something, as many of you travel throughout your time, there's no way you would go tell a premium customer that they were going to board last. But why in the world would we want to board first class in the first rows and then have everybody else towards the back of the aircraft board after and stand in front of you? And so all of those things are through the rec recommendation of experts, but also at the same time listening to your employees, customers, uh, and those that are really innovative in the medical space. I would add, um just one layer above that, which is public transit overall pre-COVID was already declining in ridership and already had an issue with trying to, um, you know, validate the model to remain a going concern, frankly. Um, but I think the, the the infrastructure that's in place is is required, especially in these very populated and densely populated cities. What is happening now post-COVID, in addition to the declining ridership that happened is, I think most companies are facing the fact that remote workforce in some way, shape or form is here to stay, whether we like it or not. It's like, it's, a, it's now a benefit and accommodations that the, the team and the employees expect. So with that is gonna come a sprawl and urbanization of where people live. The value proposition of living inside the city isn't the same anymore. So then it puts a further onus on why folks like Zipcar and Beep and others are gonna to need to extend the tentacles of what was existing public transit because it's not gonna meet the needs of sort of those communities as they sprawl out. And the, the, I think the opportunity for private, the private sector to come inside the public sector realm will, will accelerate now more than ever. Um, and that's the likes of Uber as well as Uber, um, sorry, Lyft, et cetera that could offer an extension alongside Zipcar Beep, these others that are going to be needed uh, to accommodate a post-COVID world. And I think we just have to resign to the fact that the cleansiness factors are just going to be table stakes. I mean, this is a, a, a pandemic that will shift just like 9-11 did, shifted how we travel. And uh, Scott can, is, is, can speak more to that. But there were things that just stayed, and now we're accustomed to it. I think the, the things that Scott raised and others raised are just going to be table stakes for, for the broader transportation sector. And we have to look at what's gonna be the systemic change that we have to think through of how people are going to be moving around and how public transit fits into that value chain. Yeah, and I would think um, my, my panel, oh, sorry, if I, was that Sabrina? You want to go or Raquel? No, that's uh, me, go ahead, Scott, yeah. All I was gonna say is, you know, this stuff is here to stay too. I mean, I think my panelists around the room would say, you know, 
post vaccine, we're not going to, we're going to stop cleaning. We're going to stop, you know, sort of mandating a lot of the things that we mandated. This is here to stay. I can say that from Delta's perspective, this will be something that we will do every day from this point forward. And I know my panelists as well will do that. And that, that involves everything from temperature checking every employee that walks in the door, that it's going to take care of a customer to plexiglass that's in front of employees. I mean, all of this is, are things that to protect the public but also within cities and rural urban areas, those will all, I would say those are all here. You know, I, Bob and, and Scott, you know, to echo on those comments and, you know, I see how Zipcar and Beep, you know, other it will all kind of fit into this community of the future, right? Post COVID, whatever that looks like. And so, you know, Bob, you bring up a good point of the shift of communities away from those congested city centers to more live work play communities, right? And so we've actually seen that shift as well, where, you know, we're, we're headquartered in one of our deployments is in a live, work, play community. So we're actually seeing some of that traffic pick up more on a regular basis than I would say on a, you know, the traditional banker hours, right? And so um, we're finding that people are utilizing our transportation in a different way giving up their car if they don't have to take a longer trip, you know, you know, like you would do with a zip car. And so instead of taking, you know, their car to go to the restaurant, they're actually opting to take the shuttle because it's easier than to having to find a parking spot. Um, but because we have all those safety precautions in place, you know, they know that if they come on, it's no mask, no service. I don't have to worry about my hand sanitizer because it's always on there. And so, um, you know, all of this is really just echoing on what we're seeing as a com as a company in, in many of our launch and deployment areas. Yeah, and I want to pick up on one of the, the points that um, I think all of you have talked a little bit about, which is the idea that um, living in cities, the value proposition is declining, right? Um, if you can't do all the things that you once could do. So how does that shift, and this is a question from the audience, how, how does that shift and, and affect transportation policy and strategy? And what are you guys seeing? Uh, you know, Oakland, for example, was the first one to do slow streets. I mean, what else are you guys seeing out there? So I would posit a bit of a disagreement with the idea that the value is eroding, right? I mean, I think that the world is a different place than it was on March 12th, just, you know, and, and I also remember March 13th as, as sort of a day that mm -hmm. the whole thing changed, the whole gamut changed. I will say while value proposition of city living has changed as along with everything else, I, I think that there are some real foundational pieces to what makes a city a city and what density unlocks that haven't gone anywhere. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting as we see, and I think Bob, it was Bob who said this, different states respond in different ways, right? It's not the densest necessarily of cities like New York that is seeing a bit of a resurgence. It's other areas. And so policy dictates behavior. Behavior sometimes is policy for breakfast. Like we know that. But what I've seen in the last five months is a far more nimble policymaking process. And having worked in government for many, many years, I can tell you government doesn't typically serve as the most nimble of bodies. We're fairly bureaucratic. It generally is a process-driven place. However, I think what you've seen is that there's a responsiveness needed. And cities can help bring that. And this idea of having unfettered access to all the things that make your life rich, education, schools, work, healthcare, other things, that's not going anywhere. And so I think what might change is how we think about, you know, a concept that's not new, but livability. How do we make our communities more walkable, more bikeable, have more mixed use, have more access? And really, I think it pins back to, do I have to take a car or a plane for every single trip? I hope you're not on a plane for every single trip. Getting groceries on a flight is, you know, seems a little excessive at times, but you know, for us, we actually don't want 100% of mode share. Zipcar has never wanted that because we think community is healthiest when you are walking, biking, taking transit, taking buses, carpooling, all of those pieces together. And I think that vibrancy is going to retain in cities. And we're already starting to see some of that return. Well, I'm not an expert in city and, and political what I what I will say and the stance that we've taken is people over profits and if you purely focus on profit 
you will lose in this game. You will be wiped out. And, and that is something where I, I firmly believe Delta has the leg up uh, on the industry in that we are just focused on ensuring that every measure that we're taking lives up and, and has a duty of care to every customer, every citizen, anyone that wants to travel from our perspective. But quite frankly, we're hoping others learn from what we're doing so that it kind of spreads into the community as well. You know, I think from a policy standpoint, if there's one thing that this pandemic has, has shown is that, um, you know, you look at other countries aside from the United States and they were just, you know, gung-ho on a lot of things when it came to autonomous technology. They were deploying, um, you know, autonomous vehicles that UV'd streets, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we have had some conversations, um, you know, on how maybe we can have some sort of infrastructure or policy in place that can, you know, you know to turn on in the middle of, a, of an emergency or a pandemic. And so we don't get stuck in, oh, we can't do it because of reg we're not allowed to. Right. And so um, I think that's one thing that we were able to prove during this time of that, you know, by launching that service over at Mayo Clinic is that we did it on a, uh, on a closed campus. We proved that it was safe. Uh, you know, we always stress safety, but we proved it out. And I think being able to have those proof points in times of pandemic can essentially create the roadmap. God forbid, I don't want to go through this again. And I don't think any of us want to go through this again. But at least we have some sort of roadmap and playbook now of what can we put in place in case we have to face this again in the future from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, having you know direct exposure to over a thousand cities and understanding why they have the frameworks in place to accommodate mm -hmm. policy and community needs, I think was exposed during this crisis. And specifically it exposed how 20th century infrastructure is insufficient to deal with these sort of rapid changes, especially in travel behavior. And what we've seen firsthand is broken, and we're all experiencing it, is the underlying infrastructure and system is brittle. And so we, we shouldn't have to plan for infrastructure 50, you know, for 50 years of behavioral trends and cycles and expect cities to be fortune tellers. What they need are the tools to make our cities and transportation systems more flexible, more resilient, so that you know, the future success doesn't rely on clairvoyance. And, you know, cities, ironically, were talking about autonomous vehicles, but yet they couldn't change uh, the, the price of a parking meter, you know, and make it dynamic. So like, let's just get down to basics. And I think that's what this is for. So it forced, just like companies have to focus on the core, they have to go back focusing on, uh, on the basics of what their needs were. And in that specifically highlighted the fact that they were constrained with the physical infrastructure being tied to regulatory infrastructure. For example, David, if, you, if you're in San Fran, we go to San Fran, I wanna pick up a ride share. It tells me go to level five garage and go to section B2. Well, what's B2? Today it's where I'm gonna pick up a car, tomorrow B2 could be something else. But if, if you think about cities, you know why you can go from Oakland to San Jose to San Francisco and be very different, you need a decoder ring to figure out are you compliant or not. It's because the, the physical infrastructure is tied to the regulatory infrastructure. And until you can decouple that and have an endpoint where you can make all these changes more uh, efficiently, where folks can consume that information and transact upon it, we can't even begin to think about autonomous vehicles and things that are going to really improve behaviors in the community. So I think that's really what happened during this crisis is it really focused on laying that infrastructure in place so that we can build for the future. And mm -hmm. what, what we expect to see is that uh, cities are going to start to get serious around their, their procurement needs. Uh, and that was the other thing that held, held them back. And I think uh, Sabrina mentioned that we're seeing cities trying to, you know, cut through that because they can't get out of their own way and trying to support emergency needs, whether it's health needs, social needs, or economic needs. And all of, all of that is coming uh, front and center here for officials. And you know, I'm excited. I think we should all be excited by that. That's, that's going to cause a shift for the better and hopefully improve um, our day-to-day -day as we sort of commute and navigate throughout these communities. So that's kind of what we're seeing firsthand on the front lines as, as cities are, are reacting to the crisis. Got it. I want to shift a little bit uh, just from a 
time perspective, the vehicle side of things, and maybe, you know, uh, we start with the Uber and Lyft, Lyft of the world who have also taken a huge hit. Um, and Sabrina, maybe I'll start with you on this one because you're the closest here, but how do you view the world of car sharing and ride hailing changing? So it's a great question, David, and obviously something that we're spending a fair amount of time thinking about. I would, for the sake of responding, I'd separate the two, right? It's a, you know, it's a very different model predicated on different use cases, um, relationships with, again, like bringing it back to the human um, and, and sort of place in the industry. So, you know, at Zipcar, our average trip length is actually 52 miles. Uh, that might surprise many of you, and I'm seeing some sort of shock and awe. Um, that's because we operate this round trip model where our members are thinking through, I have a very specific use case. I have a purpose, a product, a place, or people that I have to achieve using a car. And those trips are still happening, many of them essential, because they're seeking, like we talked about, that seltzer, that bookshelf, you know, the baby shower out in the burbs, whatever it might be. That average use case of 52 miles takes up a consistent strain of what I think about as trips. We talked about earlier, if you remove the commute, the rest of the trips that you make throughout the week are going to fulfill food, maybe healthcare, leisure, entertainment, childcare, things like that. They are more, A, unpredictable, but B, they're more um, responsive to your schedule and to different modes of travel. I think those are in some cases what we saw ride hail responding to was evening entertainment or late nights or not wanting to drive because of parking. Those were shorter haul trips typically that took place in congested urban cores. So I think where our paths maybe divide is a little bit about where people spend their time and how they think about what trips need to happen. For car sharing, I think, you know, frankly, we're more important than ever. Um, right now, people are making really tough decisions about whether or not they need to purchase cars. People who maybe had a one car household are struggling with the idea of buying a second car. Uh, we know cars sit unused 95% of the time. You know, try and think of another asset that you spend maybe $30,000 on that sits unused 95% of the time. And in midst of economic strain, in midst of the, you know, biggest recession we've ever seen in history, really, people are going to start thinking about how they make those investments. For us, we see car sharing as a bit of that solution, which is you don't want to buy a car to have it sit. You don't want to have to subscribe to endless maintenance, endless insurance, endless gas purchases, but you still want the freedoms associated with it. And so relying on car sharing, that I think it's even more relevant today than maybe it was on March 12th. Yep, absolutely. Um, those are all good points, Sabrina. You know, we have two cars and uh, one has not been driven in a very long time. I'm pretty sure that one doesn't have battery anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny because I was talking to some folks more on the maintenance side um, and, and dealer side in the OEM world and they were sort of saying that the number of calls that they're getting about dead batteries is just basically exponential because yeah. never before in history have people literally just not turned on for months at a time. But it goes to, it goes to really driving that question home, which is why do I own this thing? If I haven't touched it in three months, does it derive the kind of value that my family needs from an asset that is that expensive? And maybe the future of mobility, in my mind, is really far more flexible. It says, how can I invest credits? How can I invest a diversified portfolio to still allow me to get where I need to get to without maybe putting all my eggs in the two car household basket? Yeah, Sabrina, I wholeheartedly agree with your comment. We should expect Rideshare to be part of the solution to sort of, you know, a long-term value here. And But one of the most important takeaways that I'm hearing and I'm, and I'm seeing firsthand is that this period is, a, a this period is that these large transportation networks are valuable beyond just ride sharing businesses. And we see that firsthand. Uber Eats, for example, just surpassed core ridership business on revenue and has been critical infrastructure to support local businesses and restaurants. So as we think about the value, David, as you brought up for Uber and Lyft, we would argue that it's the network of drivers 
that provides value, not the specific service. And so as these networks like Zipcar, like Uber, like Lyft, as they continue to evolve, I think those networks are going to be integrated in the larger transportation of various services. And it's not just us getting around, but it's goods and services getting around. And I saw a question in the chain around, you know, cargo and all those sorts of other things. So I think you're going to start to see hub and spokes and you just saw Amazon looking at, um, you know, going brick and mortar and taking some of those uh, mall fronts for distribution centers. So I, again, and I, I see that in off street parking garages that were monthly parking garages going to be used as hubs for, you know, these sorts of types of services. So I think the networks are vital to how we're going to sort of operate in the future. And we're just going to have to think differently around how we use that asset base. Yeah. Raquel, there's actually a question in the audience for you. Are there plans for uh, the Beep fleet to pivot into cargo slash last mile delivery? I would say it's definitely something that, you know, when the founders um, started this company, um, it probably wasn't part of their plan, but being where we are now, um, there are a lot of things that are part of our plan that weren't there in the beginning. And so, you know, when we look at uh, not just using our, our vehicles as means of transporting passengers, but then how do we then use that model to not just transport passengers, but product at the same time? So you talk about repurposing and creating these hubs for uh, essentially, I would look at as uh, essential pickup locations, right? So, you know, essentially if you did have a, um, a parking structure or a, a, a drop-off facility for Amazon, there's probably nothing stopping our company from picking up that package, bringing it to the center of the community, and then serving as a, a, as a centralized pickup uh, for packages, for, for quite frankly, anything for even food service, right? So when you look at um, where we would potentially do that, absolutely. It's something that we are considering. Um, and it's, what we're also considering is how do we also then repurpose our vehicles to use them during times when we're not transporting passengers. And so if that's in the means of transporting goods uh, or potentially using the vehicles to provide some sort of roaming security, uh, you know, with this technology, it's really endless at this point. But I, whoever asked that question, yes, it is something that we are deeply considering to add to our, our uses. <laughs> Awesome. And on the more broader travel side, I know we've talked a lot, Scott, about the changes that Delta has made, uh, you know, over the past couple of months. There's a question from the audience, if you have perspectives on demand in terms of people haven't been able to travel, right, for a while, and maybe volumes are kind of picking back up, but it does feel like there is pent up demand. So any perspectives on how um, once the vaccine comes out, how things will change uh, for the travel industry. Thanks, David. I, you know, we, we wholeheartedly agree with, with sort of the timeline that Bob was laying out earlier, which is, you know, sort of a, a mid-21 sort of rebound uh, to, to sort of normalcy or, to, or the latter half of 21 to a return to normalcy, more, more so Q3, Q4. But um, look, we're not sitting around waiting for a vaccine. We are not sitting uh, idly by hoping and uh, that that supply and demand are once again reunited. Uh, you know, we have plenty of planes that are parked. As demand starts to pop up, we actually quickly add service. Uh, we're evaluating it every day. We uh, schedule load or scheduled um, or pull flights out of the schedule uh, all the time, just basically matching demand. And, and I go back to a comment I made earlier, there's, there's no model that can predict, right? And so if you had told me three months, four months ago that the Northeast of the US would, would be blocking and banning and self-quarantining 31 different states or 21 different states, depending upon the state you're in, I would have told you there's no way that, that a municipality would be doing that. But, but unfortunately they are, and we have to stay really in touch with that. And, you know, we're monitoring the same uh, reports and data that you are. We're trying to mine where people are going. Americans want to travel. I can tell you that. And and I look around and I'm sure many of you are, are ready to get on a plane. I've been on four planes in three cities in, uh, in four days now. And I, I can tell you, depending upon the city I arrive in, the mask policy is entirely different than the mask policy that I left. And some are really requiring it, like Los Angeles, where I'm from, uh, to places that uh, that when you step off, you're sort of in awe when you get into the city that it's not as mandated. And I think you just have to pay attention to that 
and, and our sort of motto or my approach has been is sort of you really have to instill confidence in travel. That, that's not only flying, but that's throughout the panelists that are sitting here today. You have to ensure that they have the confidence and the trust to believe that we have their back. And, and I do not believe it's a privilege for someone to be greeted uh, as you travel, whether it's at a restaurant or an airline, that you're treated and respected by the, the new cleanliness and the new mask and all that. I believe it is, it's, it, it is quite frankly their right. And we have to be better at mandating across all of our walks of transportation mm -hmm. what is right for the consumer and put people over profits. And, and I stand by that. But supply and demand are something that we'll, we'll constantly monitor. You know, Scott, honestly, that's a responsibility, not just for airlines, for, for autonomous vehicles, for ride share, you know, for, for everybody, frankly, because if, you know, it only takes one in the chain to lose that trust of the public. And so if we as collectively as businesses, you're right, don't put people over profits, people won't feel comfortable just even quite frankly, leaving the house, let alone getting on an airplane or, or getting into a zip car. And so I think that is the onus that all of us as companies bear right now. We all have that responsibility to help our, our country get back to where we need to be, whatever that does look like. Yeah. Sorry, that was my soapbox. <laughs> I, I agree with you fully. That's great. And I, I know we're coming up on time here. So, and I also know that there's a lot of startup founders out there. Uh, so I want to end on kind of this last topic of offering maybe a little bit of advice on, uh, you know, how small companies and startups can work with larger corporations um, and how things have changed at larger corporations um, and how the stance on partnerships have changed. So maybe Scott and, and Sabrina, you know, has COVID changed the way that you approach innovation and or partnerships with startups? And you know, what, what, what's some advice that you can provide? And then for Bob and Raquel, you know, have you seen changes with the larger enterprises and what, what strategies have you been using to, for engagement there? Want to go, Sabrina? Sure. I, you know, it'll give me a chance to say that, you know, Zipcar's parent company is Avis Budget Group. Um, and they are, you know, we are also a part of the coalition around safety and the safety pledge that Avis has taken with RB. Um, with others that Delta is a part of. And so I, I think you can answer this question in a couple of ways. One, across the Avis, Avis Budget Group portfolio and all of our smaller brands, the idea of large partnerships that help to fuel significant subject matter expertise is critical. On the Zipcar side, we continue to really invest in smaller partnerships because at the end of the day, partnerships really help drive to solutions. And I think my advice, to pivot a bit, for startups is continue to derive solutions for larger enterprises. You know, everyone is working under limited resources, limited bandwidth, limited money, whatever it might be, and yet they still have significant challenges ahead of them. And frankly, for many of us, net new challenges. You know, I'm glad Scott said supply and demand is basically what Zipcar is doing every single day right now. We're a dynamic fleet, much like airlines are. And so we fleet depending on what we're seeing. Those have, that has brought around some new opportunities, new challenges, you know, and I welcome folks who can say we have a specific, specific solution or we can derive net new value to come, the doors open for some of those conversations. Well said in the interest of time, I would just say know your audience and, and we're all looking for innovation and uh, particularly on our front, of course, medical cleanliness. Um, you know, I can't tell you, please connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll connect back with you. But, you know, you get off these, some of these WebExes at times and, you know, there are folks that are just trying to sell you things. And that's not what today's about. Today's about helping a company be successful. And we want to help the small to medium sized companies be as successful as we are trying to be. And so we're looking, we're working with hundreds of innovative companies right now to make travel and the entire ecosystem, not just curb to claim at the airport, but home to airport to hotel and back again, safer and cleaner. And so I, I welcome anyone that has solutions on that side. Great, and I guess uh, to, to close out on our end, David, on your question there, um, have, what changes um, uh, have impacted kind of the partnership angle? I think given the unprecedented priority shift for every company, it's valuable to speak to those partners and understand 
how one, they're re-aiming their effort to address COVID. And since that is the trigger for shifting priorities, it's important to understand how you as a company um, uh, can help in, in providing value um, since they've shifted and how you know you can contribute to their success. And maybe, maybe it's just not a priority now, but that's okay. It's important for you to know that and have those open discussions um, and help prioritize what's important. And, and again, going back to, to value creation. So I, I know it's probably difficult being uh, more of a smaller startup in this environment, but certainly um, making sure you've got the right partners and you're, uh, you're symbiotic in that way, um, I think it's important to have a candid discussion around. But um, like Scott, uh, thank you for, for the time and look forward to uh, being able to extend dialogue with folks. Thank you. And I would uh, I would just echo on on a lot was already said. You know, for for us, in, you know, engaging with um, larger enterprises and you know potential private and public partners, uh, we we do this, <laughs> and so you know, being able to experience it and see what it is, it's very difficult to do over Zoom, <laughs> to be quite honest. And you know, it's hard to explain. I we get the the office. What is the uh, office space question? So what would you say you do here? <laughs> And that's, that's a little difficult to show when you can't show. And so I would say when you engage when larger enterprises and your, your business is, is primarily focused on being able to show and tell a product or a service or whatever that is, look for innovative ways to bring that experience to formats like this. Um, one example that we have done is we, you know, while we can't take people onto the shuttle to show it, people exactly how it works, that's one of the primary questions we get is, we created a 360 degree experience so people can drive the experience themselves and experience it so they can see what it's like virtually to, to sit in it. Um, from engaging larger enterprises too, you know, much like what Scott, Sabrina and Bob mentioned, Many of larger enterprises don't have time to create solutions in time of COVID. There's just, they're just trying to address COVID, let alone try to sell you a product and say, oh, by the way, we haven't addressed COVID concerns. And so I would say, if you're a company trying to do that with a larger enterprise, come to the table with a solution on how you're addressing the pandemic first before you try to sell a product to someone you want to partner with. Uh, I would say for us, that has been incredibly crucial for us with, with people who have you know, contacted us. That's one of the first questions they ask is, is, quite frankly, it's not how much is this going to take, but what are you doing to adapt? And uh, for us, being able to have that game plan already able to show uh, is already that stamp of, I wouldn't say stamp of approval, but it shows that we have really thought out this process and we're not just trying to push a product. Yeah. Well, with that, Raquel, Bob, Sabrina, Scott, thank you so much for, for taking the time to discuss this with us. Um, I'm going to, I've certainly learned a lot myself today, but uh, I'm going to turn it back to Denise uh, for closing thoughts. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thanks, David, for leading such a great conversation. And thanks, Bob and Sabrina, Raquel and Scott, um, for all of your great insights on, on this discussion. And uh, thank you for everyone who joined the conversation today. So if you have um, any feedback that you want to um, send to the speakers, you can send them to me personally. I put my email address in the chat box. And other than that, hope everybody has a um, great rest of the day. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.